Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, it's still morning. Uh, welcome back to Falcon 2024 and the and the Cube's live coverage. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and co-analyst, hey. Dave Vellante. We are joined by Ilya Zaitsev. He is the CTO at CrowdStrike. Welcome back to the Cube, Ilya. Thanks for having me back. So this has been a great show. Lots of exciting announcements. Lots of new things on the platform. Talk a little bit about, about what's most exciting to you and what you're hearing from the community based on these announcements. Yeah, well, I'm a big geek, you know, first of all. <laughs> no. So I'm uh, really fired up about a lot of the innovation we're doing in AI, artificial intelligence. You know, my, my team and the CTO organization, we're driving a lot of that you know, with the data science department. And what I'm, what I'm really excited about this year is how they all kind of stack together and they work in concert. So one of the things we like to focus on is the overall analyst workflow, the end-to-end -end experience. If you're just tackling a little bit here and there, you may be speeding things up, maybe up front, but then you're just bottlenecking somewhere else later down the line. So we're looking at how we could accelerate every stage of the analyst life cycle to kind of clear all that work through and really you know, pay big dividends into how efficiently our users can operate. So everything from how we you know, use artificial intelligence to make it easier to get data into the platform, how do we make sense of that data once we have it, to turn it into actionable detections and incidents, how can we then assist the analyst in working through all that, right? And then finally, can we get even more proactive and predictive stop the issues from occurring in the first place and really boost you know, the time uh, that we're giving back to, to our users. And of course, I can, I'm happy to go into all the different things <laughs> along that, but that's kind of like the big, the big picture. The big overview. Yeah. I'm, I'm reminded, I forget what the name of that book is, but do you ever see that picture book about the system and the factory? And, and basically, you might optimize one part of the system and they're putting out widgets really it's fast. It's like conveyor belts, right? And yes, yeah. and then the other part of the system just gets overwhelmed. It's yeah. a, the kind of a Lucy Yeah, the, the, there, was a, there was an I Love Lucy episode, with exactly. The with the chocolates, yeah. right? So it's that system, and it's, it's the platform. I was struck walking in to the area with the, through the tunnel with the platform. Of course, last year, uh, we talked about your integration of Humio and, and LogScale and the Raptor announcement. Um, this year, we're hearing a lot about uh, next-gen SIM, um, basically, the platform has the data. You're feeding dashboards so they can have visibility. You're enabling uh, automation through that data. Right. You're injecting AI, and it's just, this is your flywheel. It's that synergistic feedback loop, yeah. So, what part of that synergistic feedback loop, that platform, is exciting you? What's new that you're seeing here, that you're announcing here, that we should be aware of? Yeah, let me kind of like step you through that, that sequence, if you will. So again, first point is, how can we get the information into the, into the platform, right? That's a huge overhead for a lot of organizations. It's an obstacle to being able to adopt modern technology, to migrate you know, to best of breed platforms. Um, a lot of it starts with, how do you convert the data sources from all these different products and vendors and standards you know, into one area? So we've actually just released something we call AI-generated parsers. It's an AI system where all you do is describe it, hey, I'd like, to, I'd like you to build a parser for me that can process logs from this source, and then you just give it a couple examples. Hey, here's three or four sample lines, go figure it out. And it actually will build the parser on its own. You can even give it documentation in case you can't find enough examples to cover all the different edge cases. You can give the AI documentation to learn about the source format, build it for you. It even does self-healing. As it creates the parser, it checks it against your test data. If it sees a mistake, an error, it'll try to fix it and keep going until it gets something that works. And then when you're all done, it can explain and answer questions about what it did. And then if everything looks good, you load it right into next-gen sim and you just start sucking all that information in. So okay. That's okay, and so if, if, if I can play that back, I'm hearing that you can harmonize all that disparate data and make sense out of it. Yep. And it's, it's a combination, it's, it's AI. Does, does the knowledge graph that you guys built years ago play into that, and if so, how does it play into that? Oh, absolutely, so one of the key concepts, the way this works, right, we're using you know, generative AI systems because they're really good at just reading and understanding the data. It looks like these, generated, uh, these generative AI systems, they have a better intuitive understanding of, hey, this thing looks like an IP address, this thing looks like a domain name, you know, the, the description of it similar, 
it's starting to understand this concept of semantic meaning. Right. right? So what we're doing internally, and this is actually a big driving force behind how we can do this. Um, some of the other improvements we've announced this week, like Project Kestrel that lets us bring all the data visually to the analyst in one place, it works because we're semantically modeling all these different data sets in our platform, but also external data that's coming in. So it doesn't matter what it's called from all these different systems, intuitively it understands that, hey, it, you're all talking about an IP address. You may have a slightly different version of the label here and there, but by tagging with that semantic meaning, we can now turn these more powerful systems that intuitively understand that against all these disparate data sets and really bring them closer together. And, and historically, the hard part about getting information out of that system is the, the, the query language, if you will, or whatever you call it in your world, is arcane, all right? So you guys took care of that complexity. Now with AI, does it change the way in which I interact or you interact with the system, both ends of that. Yeah, absolutely, and that's, that's a, a you know, big driving force behind what we're doing with Charlotte, yep. right? We talked a lot about Charlotte last year, um, sure. you know, being able to have conversations with the system, right? So, you, know, you can, like we talked about previously, you literally can give feedback to the AI-generated parser to make changes and improvements. You can then also have it create the queries for you. So again, you can just intuitively, as an analyst, talk about what you want to find, what you want to search for, et cetera, and it's going to do the hard work of turning that into the underlying query. You don't have to be an expert in those query language syntax anymore. You just got to focus on the concepts, the semantic meaning, like we talked about earlier. Don't worry about what the label is internally. Let the machine take care of that for you. So how, it, how does that change the skill set necessary to be a good analyst? Because as you said, you don't necessarily need to be so in the weeds with the technology, but you do need to understand what it is you're looking for in order to have a, a conversation with the data and, and, and get to the, to the truth. Well, actually, that's a great segue for me to talk about one of the newest features we just announced in You're Charlotte. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> it's called detection triage. So, yeah. it actually, so you basically, as an analyst, will say, "Hey, I see this detection that came in. Help me work through it." Right? Even if you don't know exactly the questions to ask, the first thing Charlotte does is it looks at all the information coming from that detection and actually tells you, the system tells you, this is most likely a true positive. Here's the summarization of all the key points of what's going on. So that kind of gets you started. Oh, the system thinks this is worth investigating, but what do I do next? Well, guess what? If you want to keep going, you tell Charlotte, help me scope and triage this, and then it writes the queries for you, right? You don't have to know the underlying syntax. It writes you the next gen sim query that says, on this detection you're looking at, these are the things we pulled out. Here's a query to go check where else that might be in the environment, things that are related to this initial detection actually help you scope out and build that incident, and then you go one step further. Okay, I found, you know, you've helped me find where the problems are, how do I fix it? You may not know exactly how to do it, but you know you got to get it fixed. It'll actually generate a response script for you and say, hey, this, these are the things we saw, here's the actions you take, would you like me to take it, yes or no? Boom, hit go, and now you've just been guided through working through the entire detection and incident all the way from triage to response. And if I have Charlotte, I get this, is that right? That's or, correct. Okay, yeah. so I wonder if you could talk about Charlotte adoption, because you guys priced it for adoption. I think it was, I don't know, 20 or $30 per year, per endpoint, I think. I can't remember the exact pricing, but it wasn't like per month. So what's adoption look like? How, how is it being used in the real world? Yeah, so it's the, you know, numbers are growing, right? We have huge interest, a lot of people signing up for it. But the way the pricing works is it's simple per endpoint, right? But it also has to recognize the fact that the usage patterns don't necessarily align to the number of endpoints, it's how much the analyst interacts with it. So you price it by the endpoint because that's what all the procurement, sales, budget people know how to operate, yeah, it's yeah. simple. And then based on the amount of systems you have, we give you a bunch of queries that you can then utilize almost like a token, right? Yep. Whatever you want to do, which makes sense though because it's that interaction that drives you know, the, the, the load on the system. So you don't necessarily need Charlotte to answer a question for every single detection. It's just the ones that you're investigating. So you're basically selecting when and where you want to deploy it as you're interacting with, with the data. So it's like a cloud consumption model. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. So of course you could always top up more, right? If you're going through, if you're burning that down and you want more on top of what you get with like that baseline per endpoint allocation, you can always tack on you know, more queries. Replenish your mass pike 
toll. <laughs> right, okay. your easy pass. Yeah. 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 Easy pass. Right. We both live in Massachusetts. Yeah. So how does this change or the, the user experience in terms of how they get the most value out of the platform? And, 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 and I mean, what is your recommendation there? What are your so thoughts? I think the, the great thing about these new like conversational generative interfaces, you can get operational with them right away if you have any fundamental understanding of what these systems do, even if you don't know exactly how to do it. So maybe you've come from you know, another role, another company where they weren't using CrowdStrike technology. You know, you're new to CrowdStrike, but you're not new to security. Historically, that would mean, okay, time to go read a bunch of documentation, watch some training videos, right? There's kind of this ramp up period. But you've used security technology before. You intuitively have a grasp of, it should be able to do these sorts of things, even if I don't know how to do it. With the conversational interface, you don't have to figure out where do I go to click this button to say, hey, do this operation. I know intuitively you can do it. I haven't figured out how to do it yet. And not only will it do it for you, but it's explaining how it did it so you can actually learn as you go versus having to start by ramping up first before you can get operational. You can immediately hit the ground running. I think that's a, that's a big difference. Really helps with you know, skills, shortage, you know, and all that. We had Allie Mellon, I think it was Allie Mellon on from Forrester. I think it was last year. I don't know if she's here this week, but she was doing research um, on the SOC analyst experience, which is not, a, at the time anyway, a widely researched effort. And I, I was struck by that because I think when you talk to CISOs, they'll tell you lack of talent is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, we heard today culture, mm -hmm. you know, bad human behavior is one of their other big challenges. But that SOC analyst experience, it's really starting to, to change. Uh, have you been able to discern a, a, a meaningful change over the last couple of years? Charlotte, obviously, more automation, more AI, um, anything else? Uh, what, what's the change been like in the sort of near to midterm? Yeah, so I think the, the really big thing that we're doing there, so let's, let me go back for a second and kind of dovetail something you mentioned earlier. Last year we were talking about Raptor, right? This big back-end upgrade, bringing in all this advanced next-gen SIM, search, ingest capability in the platform. So we, we finished that migration, right? We've got almost 30,000 customers adopted on the Raptor back-end. So now we've turned our attention and thought, kind of like before, right? The conveyor belt's moving faster on the back-end, but if the analyst doesn't have the way to work with all that data, you know, they're just going to get bottlenecked later on. So now we've announced something called Project Kestrel. Yep. Another fast bird, right? Raptor Kestrel. See some themes, right, with our naming. <laughs> so Kestrel is all about not just reimagining the user experience, but two key things. Complete control to the end user and the ability to break down data silos. So what I mean by that, going back to your question here, there's so many different personas now as our platform has grown. It's not one, two, three modules anymore. It's 28 different modules. You've got IT, you've got security, you've got SOC, you've got you know, instant responders. There's no real one size fits all way that they're going to want to interact with all this data in the platform. So with Kestrel, you can completely customize your experience, your user interface. We've got all the out of the box stuff, the way that you know, we think works well for the majority of users, but now based on my persona, based on my team, I can go create my own homepage with my own widgets, right? Tailored to the way I need to operate, the problems I need to solve. And going further, as you build out these widgets, the concept of these different modules kind of fades into the background. You can actually take the different data sets, and this is a huge thing for us, and essentially join them. So instead of looking at you know, your cloud data here, your identity data here, your vulnerability data here, I can create a grid, if you will, a report, an interface that meshes all three of those things together and just blends them into one seamless experience. That's huge, right? Really being able to tailor it to the individual, to the task at hand. And again, everyone can have a different experience, optimized for what they need. And, and what's the secret sauce behind that? It's, is it your parser? We talked about your knowledge graph. There's some AI in there. I'm trying to envision a block diagram of all it's, the tech that's It's kind of what of I alluded to earlier when we were talking about like the AI generated parsers. It's because we've done a lot of work internally. This, it's a concept we call semantic data modeling. Yeah. Because we've linked all these things internally on the back end to their meaning, the UI now basically programmatically assembles itself by focusing on those different meaning points. Right? So it doesn't matter where the data's coming from. I'm telling you, here's the meaning I'm after. I can assemble a user interface that does that. And then when I run a query, again, I can focus on that abstraction. Right? Don't get into the details. Go to this higher level of abstraction and focus on these 
semantic data types. And to are. the extent that you have that harmonized, I use the term harmon harmonized, because sometimes semantic layer gets confusing, but, but, but we'll, we can use that. But, but once you have that data you know, coherent, then agents that are governed can start to work on that very confidently. You can build these systems of agency. Yep. Um, and that's really where it ties back to the SOC analyst experience. Uh, um, I'm intrigued by this because I don't know how closely you follow the application space, the application stack and the data stack, and it's just one big mess. You got all this data locked in silos. Um, you've got a, a, an analytics system that's asynchronous and separate, and basically not real time, mm -hmm. which doesn't work in your world. You solved a lot of those problems, and I'm just envisioning, envisioning in this world of agents, everybody's talking about agents now, applying technology like what you've developed to the broad application stack. I don't yeah. know, I don't know if there's a question there, but it's. <laughs> well, you're giving me an idea for something we could talk about, <laughs> which is this, probably the thing I'm, the, sing, the one single thing that I'm most excited about in everything that we're releasing and talking about this week, which is a project we call Signal. It's something that um, you know, our research team has been working on for four years and we're kind of ready to now unveil it to the world. Signal is a, not just a new model, but it's a brand new family of models. It, it's a statistical time series analysis engine. A couple, a lot of big words, some math, well, but what does it boil yeah, down yeah. to? It's a detection mechanism that doesn't need to know or care about how the underlying systems it's interacting with work. All I need to know is the time something occurs, the unique serial number, like I see behavior one, two, three, five minutes ago, and then five minutes later I see behavior four, five, six. I don't actually need to understand what those behaviors mean, I just need to know that they're different, they occurred at this time, and they're talking about this machine or this user. What Signal does is it builds a unique statistical model of how common these events are, not at a global level, not even at a customer level, but at an individual endpoint level. So if you think about it, we have tens of millions of sensors deployed out there. We are actually, we developed a technology that lets each one of these tens of millions of systems have not just their own unique model, for every behavior, right? For the thousands of behaviors we categorize, each one has its own model that says, hey, this behavior on this machine, it only occurs on average once or twice a day normally. This behavior occurs thousands of times a day, so what's unusual for one may not be the same for the other, but by building an individual model, we can then say, hey, if all these different behaviors are firing at an extremely unlikely probability, that's not a coincidence, there's an attack underway. Not only have I identified it, but I can say that these are all linked. These different, I'm not just creating detections, I'm creating incidents. And we've actually been running this kind of silently on the back end, collecting data, proving it out. And what we've seen is that on average, a signal incident consists of 20 disparate behaviors that we were detecting previously. So now, bring it back to the analyst, the user experience, instead of investigating 20 different alerts, I've got one. If you do the math, that's a 95% reduction in volume or a 20 times you know, improvement uh, in efficiency that I can process with. And we're starting, of course, with the endpoint data, because that's our bread and butter. We already have signal family models being developed for identities, for cloud. And what I'm really excited about, because we've done all this work with the semantic models and all that, we can start applying signal technology to third party data from different vendors. We don't have to tailor it to a specific firewall technology, for example. We can build a signal model that applies to any firewall telemetry. No idea how it works behind the scenes. I don't need to know, because I'm looking at these unique statistical models. So, if you can't tell, I'm pretty excited. Yeah, pretty that's that's yeah. amazing. And so there's metadata in there, and also model data as well, right? And so you've got, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm struggling for another question, but it sounds like you've got this unified metadata model, and also more enrichment from other data, including third party data, that you and, can then. And the key here is, the math is actually not that complicated. It's doing it at this scale and volume, right? Tailoring it for this unique level of granularity. That's where the real engineering magic lies. Yeah, you see, you described it as time series. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. It's well known and. Yeah, it's like what people yeah. use for you know, quantitative trading, right. right? It's the same kind of technology, but again, instead of doing it for 500 stocks in the portfolio, we're doing it for hundreds of millions of these combinations of endpoints, behaviors, et cetera. Wow. As you said, it's where the magic lies. Ilya, thank you so much for coming back on theCUBE. It's always a pleasure having you on. Love having, I love being, love you guys <laughs> having me here. We love you, man. Can't wait to do it again next time. All right.
I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.